Cheese Its or Saltines? <laughs> so not audience participation, but thank you. Um, <laughs> what does this nurse think I am? Some kind of animal? Cheese Its, obviously. I took the red pouch with a shaky hand from the angel, sizing up the amount of crackers that actually made it into the small bag. Nine. Not nearly enough to stave off the toxic vat of nausea bubbling inside me. Thanks, capitalism. Before the procedure, they told me I'd feel like this once the sedation wore off, but I wasn't prepared for the wave of anxiety that accompany it as I came to alone in a giant room separated from the other traumatized women inside it by only flimsy medical curtains, their cast silhouettes in various states of mourning. On my left, a woman panicked as she said, I killed it, I killed it, please God forgive me. I hear the nurse's voice, you didn't kill anything. It was just a small group of cells, okay? We got it so early, nothing even started to form yet. On my right, another woman whimpered into her cell phone. You went to the beach with your friends? I told you you had to wait nearby. We were sitting so close to each other, I could hear the stupid fucking dumbass on the other end of the phone. Sorry, babe. You didn't tell me how long it was going to take. We just have to finish up here and forget it. She cried. And I started to cry with her. I fought back the urge to reach my hand out and touch our mutual curtain in a futile gesture to make her feel less alone. Can my boyfriend give her a ride? I asked the nurse through tears as she walked by my chair. Unfortunately, with COVID, no. It was the same answer I got when I asked if someone could come into the clinic with me that day. As I walked into the Planned Parenthood earlier that morning, I thought about how I got there. For what was now the second time, in less than six months. Oh. The sequel had felt very similar to the first iteration, except for a few key differences. For starters, the first go round, I had the electric experience of walking through the infamous pro-life protesters <laughs> on my way to the door. Or in this case, the protester, a sad... <laughs> One sad, adorable old man hunched over on First Avenue at 7 a.m. doing the Lord's work. <laughs> As I walked by him, I fought the temptation to just pat him on top of his cute little head. <laughs> he was like the old man from Up. <laughs> Except instead of balloons, he was holding a binder filled with laminated pro-life propaganda and photos of bloodied baby carcasses uh, that I love to imagine he printed out by the dozens at Kinko's earlier that morning while whistling a tune. These two would be his ticket to the heavens. I passed him with a soft smile, feeling like that was the least I could do for a man who was watching a murderer just slip right through his fingers. I mean, brutal. <sighs> from his perspective. You're not even gonna try to trip me or something? Not even pray for a sprained ink, nothing? When I got to the front desk, I paid for my abortion with a stimulus check debit card that our anti-choice conservative government reluctantly passed. Yeah! <laughs> a transaction that, despite the present circumstance, brought me immense pleasure. If this was what exploiting loopholes, <laughs> loopholes felt like, I suddenly understood the appeal of being a Republican. <laughs> the first procedure went all right, except for one small hiccup, a hiccup the doctor labeled as potentially fatal, but nothing to worry about. You see, immediately after you get an abortion, they empty the contents of their dust devil vacuum onto a Petri dish uh, to confirm whether or not they ghost busted the pregnancy all right. <laughs> I had named mine Casper. <laughs> I'd always really liked Casper. <laughs> but apparently he was nowhere to be found in the tissue sample. 
uh, which I was told could mean one of two things. One, that I was so eager to get this unwanted child out of my hostile pussy that the cells hadn't even grown enough yet to be detectable by modern science. Or two, that I had an ectopic pregnancy, meaning the pregnancy could be growing outside of my uterus and if untreated, could rupture my fallopian tube, causing agonizing pain, hemorrhaging, and possibly death. Nothing to worry about. Blood work in the coming days would confirm that my pregnancy hormones had dropped, indicating that Casper was in the Petri dish the whole time and was officially set free from the pathologically disheveled, financially drowning, manic-depressive potential parent that I was at the time. My body, my health, and my future were in the clear. That was until a few months later, when Casper II, <laughs> the last Casp happened. <laughs> and I legitimately Googled if Planned Parenthood had a punch card program for the poor, fertile souls like me. This is a real image I found on a forum. Holy shit. Much to both my and the conspiracy theorist who made this image's dismay, they did not actually have an abortion rewards program, and I was on the hook again for an expensive trip to my old friend. Trying to avoid the cost of additional blood work associated with an ectopic pregnancy scare again, I figured it'd be cheaper to wait a couple more weeks to get the abortion this time around. Then I'd have a smaller chance of needing to charge more blood work to my almost maxed out $15,000 credit card. Now, if you're listening to this and thinking, Jesus, this lady really doesn't have her shit together. <laughs> my point exactly. <laughs> Carrying on. As it turns out, waiting a couple more weeks into the pregnancy meant experiencing more of the extra shitty symptoms of pregnancy. And the seven days leading up to my second abortion were filled with nausea that was so bad, I was convinced I was incubating the Antichrist. <laughs> Every morning I'd wake up and just projectile vomit, then bear crawl my way to my office chair and onto Zoom, forcing an ungodly smile <laughs> at my viciously unpregnant coworkers. I couldn't tell anyone at work, and I couldn't take the week off. There's no such thing as anti-maternity leave. <laughs> it should be a thing, though. Yeah. It should. Yeah. Fucking sucks. So I suffered in pain, shame, and the lingering smell of yak until February 9th, 2021, the day I got my life back. And my six month, Long nightmare was over. Now, it's probably time I address the elephant in the womb. How'd I get pregnant twice in six months? It was my then boyfriend's genius idea to come inside me without a condom. He said all we had to do was work with my cycle, and if we just had sex during certain parts of the month, when I was less fertile, we'd be fine. Trust me, he said. I used to do it with my ex, Amy, all the time. Oh, well, that's a comforting image. Thank you. I was highly skeptical of this clearly atrocious idea, but he continued to push, and eventually I relented. And much to not my surprise, the first and only time we did that, I got pregnant and I was pissed, but silently pissed. Like, could I really blame him? I had the option to say no, though. I did. He gave me an out every time he asked, over and over and over again. It had always been highly inconvenient to my partners that I wasn't on the pill. I tried going on hormonal birth control multiple times in my life in the service of men not wearing condoms, but every time something went wrong. I gained weight with an eating disorder, not an option. I fell off my dad's health insurance, couldn't pay out of pocket costs. One time I even landed in the ER with a multi-day string of migraine with aura that was so painful, all I could do to try to end my vision impaired agony was close my eyes and cry in the fetal position. The doctor suspected the episodes were triggered by the hormones in my new birth control. 
I carried a guilt with me through most of my adult life that I was the only thing standing between my partner and their pleasure. And I relented because I was sick of feeling that, but not as sick as I felt when I read that positive test for the first time, and it hit me that I would have to bear the weight of all of this bullshit on my own. I should have left him a couple times before, honestly, like the time we were having sex during our first month of dating, and I asked him to pull out, and moments later, he didn't. And I had to take plan B again for the third time that month. Or the times when I'd wake up in the morning to his hard dick pressed against me, humping me awake, despite the fact that I told him so many times that that's not how I wanted to enter my waking life in the morning. An object of his carnal compulsion, swatting him away like a rapey fart cloud. Just fucking <laughs> just every morning, dude. <sighs> this part's gonna suck. Okay. Men have exercised control over my body and life as long as I can remember, though. At six, I was molested by my next door neighbor repeatedly. He followed my family around, forcing us to move three times in two years until I ultimately aged out of his age of interest. The cops said there wasn't anything they could do to make him stop stalking me because he technically wasn't doing anything wrong. At 18, I was lured into a room at a party by a stranger when I was trying to find my boyfriend. He told me he knew my boyfriend and that he was in the room he was taking me to, but when he shut the door behind us, I quickly realized that nobody else was in the room but us, and my heart and stomach sank. I panicked as he came towards me, and right before he pushed me onto the bed, my friends busted into the room, pulling me away from him. Nobody, including myself, said anything to the man who just got caught trying to rape me, because he was just drunk. At 19, an unhinged Hunter S. Thompson wannabe from OkCupid okay stealthed me the first time we had sex, pulling the condom off without telling me. When I finally noticed what he did, I let him keep going, because I didn't think it was that bad in the moment. When I told him I didn't want to see him again after that, though, he proceeded to stalk me, and he emailed me incessantly and unsolicitedly chapters of a shitty sad boy book he was writing about me, romanticizing the night we had together. At 21, people who I thought were my best friends got me drunk to the point where I'd fallen and cut my knees on the ground twice before they took me into their apartment to have sex with me. Something they'd asked to do with me before sober, but I had vehemently said no to so many times. But this time I got drunk and didn't say no, so it didn't count as assault. At 22, four men on separate occasions forcefully and painfully shoved their dick in my butt without asking but I didn't count it as rape because they were already penetrating my vagina, so I let them keep going, even though it hurt so bad. At 23, on a business trip, my boss asked me if I wanted to go up to his hotel room and have sex. I said no, and he fired me one week later and defamed me to my coworkers, calling me unprofessional and a pain to work with. Then too, I said nothing. And by the time I was ready to try to pursue any legal recourse years later, the statute of limitations had passed. In every single shitty instance, it's been about control. And a woman afraid and trained to not say or do anything about it. And I need all of that to end. When I got the news notification on my phone at 5.40 p.m. on May 2nd, 2022, that the Supreme Court was planning to vote to strike down Roe v. Wade my ears started to ring, and I lost my night to silence. Sick and shaking, I stayed on the phone with the guy I'm seeing as he tried to give me space to vent, but I was past the point of venting. I had no kinetic energy left inside me, just pain. My soul was truly crushed, and I was in mourning. That my freedom and the freedom of the woman I shared a recovery room with that day is soon to be gone, and in its place, the perpetrators that punctuated their pain give in a place to flourish. Like the breed-thirsty church whose indoctrination leaves women on the other side of the curtain weeping with guilt, and will now leave them weeping again, this time carrying their children of rape or incest. Or the selfish, reckless men who could knock their partners up but couldn't even be bothered to pick them up from their abortion on time? and left them waiting alone on the curb like the deadbeat dad he was sure to have been. I wish I had an idea of what I'm supposed to do now, 
how I'm supposed to fight. How do you convince a person of something so undeniable as the right to decide when you become the host of a financially and biologically draining organism? How do you even find the words to make someone understand that it's sick and twisted to force motherhood on a person? Or that my future should be dictated by this guy? Sometimes I wonder if I should swing by Planned Parenthood for old time's sake and bring my old friend some flowers and an invitation just to chat. We can sit down on a bench side by side. I can flip through his murder binder as he flips through my gender studies textbook, <laughs> which will definitely include a picture of titties at some point, by the way, so it is not a fair trade. <laughs> and we can pretend for a moment that we respect each other's opinions and imagine a world where we didn't have to fight anymore because we knew that we were both coming from equally valid, lived experiences that left us with the legitimate views we had. Psych, that guy can suck my fucking dick. <laughs> Thank you. Let Jordan Coburn hear it, everybody!